7 through 11 in our context is that the church is reminding us we're preparing for Jesus' coming. And so we look at a passage that speaks to Jesus' second coming, both in order to set some understanding of what it was like a few days before the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, and also, though, to speak to what you and I wait for today, the coming of the Lord, remembering that he did come, and that's a guarantee of his coming again, and that in his coming, he didn't come as anybody expected, least of all Mary and Joseph. I mean, (laughs) that was as big a surprise for them. (laughs) I love Luke's gospel where it said Mary kept these things and pondered them in her heart. You know, she just, even after the baby's here, she still doesn't know what to do with it. And uh, that image at at the temple when Jesus is 12, Mm -hmm. she points to Joseph and says, your father and I have been worried and he points to the temple and said, I had to be in daddy's house doing his business. You know, that's, she still doesn't understand. And so how less did anybody else understand? The only people who didn't have any understanding were the Magi. And they get a bunch of kids killed by their question. Where's the real king? <laughs> and they asked that to Herod, the most uh, vicious person in, in, in the Bible. So, we read. What was that scripture again? I'm sorry. Five, James five. James five. Okay. Seven through eleven. You said Hebrews. Yeah, that's what I thought. My bad. My bad. My bad. My bad. My bad. Sometimes I only I'm, I'm thinking too much about what I'm supposed to say instead of focusing on where I am in the moment. No judgment here. I'm scared right. <laughs> I've gotten okay. to the place I could hide my own Easter eggs <laughs> or buy my own Christmas present. <laughs> Be patient, then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You've heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Let me go ahead and read 12. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no, otherwise you will be condemned. And let us pray. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable or in the name of Jesus become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. James falls uh, into the category of of wisdom literature if you were looking at, at Hebrew scripture. It's a lot of advice. Uh... My professor in seminary said that except for the fact that in line one, you've got the Lord Jesus Christ, you could be reading Old Testament scripture. I don't know that I would go that far. And the reason I added verse 12 was to show how much James depends on Matthew chapter five. Right back to back, uh, you've got references uh, that that look to Matthew chapter five in uh, verse 11 and in 12 uh, here uh, about perseverance uh, in face of uh, attack uh, you've got the reminder in the uh, Beatitudes that Jesus says blessed are those who are persecuted blessed uh, you know you suffer all manner of uh, 
unrighteousness, you know, great is your reward in heaven. And then very clearly in verse 12, you've got this reference to Matthew 5, 34 through 37 about don't swear, uh, not by heaven or by earth. That was, by the way, a very common thing in those days. And all you need to say is yes or no. He's, he's taken uh, four verses of Jesus and just condensed it down to one verse. The essence is there. And they're going to obviously recognize the source when he quotes this. But uh, I don't think of it as Jewish in origin, but it's very much like Jewish wisdom literature where this is what it takes. Right before this, you've got uh, him speaking harshly against rich people who oppress. Verse 1, now listen you rich people, weep and wail. Ah. All right. Skipping down to verse 4. The wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. Reckon which side of the fence James is sitting on when he <laughs> says that. You know, he's, it's, you know, you rich people. And then he skips down in this next section and calls them brothers and sisters. He, 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 he uses this idea of a close connection, his identity with the people that will read this. And that's being reinforced. I was in uh, Walmart the other day sitting on the old guy's bench, you know, where all the husbands sit. And Lexington, y'all been there before. <laughs> and a uh, fella sitting on the other end of the bench uh, is greeted by a man who walks past. And in three minutes conversation, he was the, the man walking past called him brother four or five times and then walks on. And uh, I looked at the fellow down at the end of the bench. I said, he's a pastor, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he's not your pastor. As he said, no, but, but, you know, and he went on to explain. And, you know, it was obvious the guy was trying to uh, make us a feeling of connection, that they're, they're strongly bound together. That's what James is doing. He has, he has pointed out, the evils of people who rob those who have less than them. And uh, that is a sticking point. Wealth in general is, 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 is not a sign of God's favor. Uh, it's not a sign of God's disfavor either. But how you deal with your money is very much in keeping with uh, uh, God's judgment. If you rob, if you withhold wages... And again, even that is from a quotation from Matthew where, you know, Jesus said if you take a, a cloak, an outer garment, what we would, you know, it would be a combination uh, overcoat, sleeping bag, uh, blanket today. And uh, if you take it and pledge, you've got to return it every night mm -hmm. <laughs> so that the guy's got a place to sleep. Mm -hmm. So we pick up with be patient here. Patience equals endurance. I uh, had a friend yesterday tell me that he'd been praying for patience and he was going to stop. He, f he finally read the epistle of James where it turns out praying for patience means you're going to get tribulation because patience <laughs> is something that's earned. And that continues here in chapter 5. That was chapter 1, James. And, and here at chapter 5, it's very much this idea that patience means endurance in face of affliction. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. Again, it's the second coming. But his first coming and his second coming are both about the same thing, God's kingdom. And it takes two comings for Jesus to bring about the fullness of God's kingdom on earth. His image then on how we're to be patient comes from the agricultural area. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. They have rain twice a year in the, in the uh, Holy Lands. And, uh, if something happens that 
they don't go well, they're in trouble. This image is used so much in the Old Testament. It's used at Deuteronomy 11.4, Jeremiah 5.24, Hosea 6.3. I mean, it's a common image of what it is to endure. It's, it's to be like a farmer. Uh, you heard the phrase before, uh, eat your seed corn. Uh, these people, every time they plant, they're betting their life because they're putting the very last bit of food, they're burying it. They're, they're burying their last bit of food. And if that fails, they die. Number one reason for war in uh, antiquity is famine. The wealthiest person on the planet in that day knows he could starve to death in six months, no matter what today looks like. They don't have methods of preparation preservation that we have today. They don't have uh, methods of farming like we have today. Locusts, uh, insects, rats, any kind of plague. And suddenly the entire land is in famine. And you see that in Hebrew scripture several times where they're selling uh, uh, horse heads or eating children in order to stay alive. You remember Solomon's judgment against uh, the woman. Uh, well, that's not famine. That's where she rolls over, kills her kid. But uh, uh, where is it that uh, you've got uh, a lady agreeing, two women get together and agree to eat one lady's baby, and then the next day, uh, you know, the baby is hidden. And so, you know, they're fussing about that. The king just goes crazy and, you know, starts wailing that his kingdom has come to this, that they're arguing about why can't we eat your baby? Be patient. This is the illustration. Stand firm. Why? Because the Lord's coming is near. That was advice given, what, 2,000 years ago? Does it feel like the Lord's coming is near? This is, this is from God's point of view. In God's timetable, God who lives outside of time and eternity. It's, it's as brief as it can be. <clears throat> but as Jesus appeared the first time, suddenly, after long waits, so he will again. It speaks to both sides, to both comings. The Lord's coming is near. All right, the big danger is because we've had to wait. And, and again, James is written very early, first century. And they're already in danger of what happens when people wait too long. Don't grumble against one another. It's easy if you wait too long, if you suffer too much, to start finding fault with people inside your group. It, the best image is a family going on vacation where three or four kids are going, are we there yet? And then they start bickering and fighting and, you know. I only had one kid, but I have definite remembrances of the station wagon uh, that I traveled in as a boy and my brother and sister and it just you know the grumbling you wait too long you lose patience that's the big danger what will happen to the community if you don't address this you start fighting you grumble and bicker and it becomes war Again, he mentions brothers and sisters. He's not tying himself to them. He's tying them to each other. Uh, don't grumble or you'll be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Uh, you know, Matthew 7 talks about in verse 1 and 2, uh, don't judge lest you be judged. 
people misunderstand that and think that's referencing uh, uh, judgment of behavior. It's not. It's judgment of salvation. We're told in 1 Corinthians that we're supposed to judge behavior of those inside the body. You know, the behavior, not the salvation. But Matthew 7, Jesus, when he says, do not judge lest you be judged, he's saying, don't call that person an un unchristian. That's, that's one of the biggest dangers we can do is to judge like that. And uh, we start grumbling one another. And next thing you know, somebody said, and you call yourself a Christian. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that one before? Mm -hmm. All right. That's <laughs> oh my! I bet I'm the only one here that's ever been called a sanctimonious twit. <laughs> I don't think on separate occasions, but not together. <laughs> yeah. People I run around with don't talk. <laughs> they didn't have a choice. Did <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> Don't grumble or you'll be judged. You know, don't judge. The grumbling here is the grumbling that starts the whole idea of we can't be brothers and sisters. And since I'm saved, obviously you're not. And it's that kind of grumbling. The judge is at the door. That reflects God. The judge is at the door. But something else reflects God brothers and sisters as an example of patience in the face of suffering take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord by speaking in the name of the Lord it's like remember when Jesus said whatever you pray for in my name it's in my nature according to my will these prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord are reflecting also the Lord, just like the judge is standing at the door reflects the Lord. These prophets who endure with patience reflects God. And so ultimately God is behind the endurance and the patience. Uh, not forever patient. There'll be a time when he comes as judge. But brothers and sisters, as an example of patience. Now, this is the second example. The first example is the farmer. But in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Again, let's look at this idea of what does it mean to be in the name of the Lord. Automatically, that rules out what? False prophets. But it focuses on the primary responsibility of a true prophet to get the word of God accurately. That's the difference. And we're not talking about here just those prophets that got recorded in Hebrew scripture. We're talking about any that spoke what God wanted said faithfully. Second Chronicles 18, uh, beginning... I'm not sure where that begins. I, I did the highlighter over it. <laughs> I can't see where the verse started. Verse 5. So the king of Israel brought together the prophets, 400 men, and asked them, Shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I not? Isn't it interesting, the language, Shall we go to war, or shall I not? Go, they answered, for God is going to give it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat asked, Is there no longer a prophet of the Lord to whom we can inquire of? Jehoshaphat's, you know, he's, he's suspicious here. <laughs> the king of Israel answered Jehoshaphat, uh, There is still one prophet through whom we can inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he never <laughs> prophesies anything good about me, but always bad he is. Micaiah, son of Imelah. The king should not say such a thing, Jehoshaphat replied. So the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, Bring Micaiah, son of Imeliah, at once. Turns out those 400 men are false prophets. 
He calls all the prophets together, except one, except the only guy who's going to tell him the truth. And they all lie. And that's what it is to speak in the name of the Lord. It's to get the it's to get the word right. And and so we count as uh, we take those prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You've heard about Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Several things you can you can see here. To do God's will means it's highly likely you'll face great adversity. Highly likely. And yet it is possible to persevere. And as you persevere, you'll find out it was God at work the whole time. You've heard of Job's perseverance and have seen not what Job did, but what the fine, but what the Lord finally brought about. So it's back to saying God working in us and I allow it. And it concludes the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. You know, obedience usually ends in suffering. By grace, you can remain faithful. And at the end, you'll be talking about the goodness of God. All right, now this is my text. I've already commented on what I wanted to say uh, on, on verse 12. But uh, again, the idea is that you look at the prophets. Hebrews six fifteen, and this is where I got Hebrews earlier because it's the last thing I looked up before I started talking. Only after Abraham patiently endured uh, did he receive the promise. And so patient endurance is the key. What are your thoughts?